Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the New Life Vineyard. It's good to see you today. Glad you guys came out to worship with us. As always, we're going to spend some time singing to the Lord our God, just telling him how good he is, how much we love him, how much we appreciate all he's done for us and his son, Jesus. Will you guys pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you so much for letting us be here. I just pray that uh, we glorify you this morning, Lord God. And we just pray that you would draw us close to you, for we know that you are good and your love endures forever. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Will you guys stand up and let's all sing together this morning.
Praise God. He is good. Give thanks. Away, your love never 
holy is our Lord indeed. And the book of Isaiah says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. This is what he says. I dwell in the high and the holy place. You see, our Lord, our God is holy indeed, above all else, above all others. And that's why we praise him. We honor him and we glorify him. Will you guys pray with me? Father God, we come before you and we thank you so much for being who you are. Thank you for letting us come before you and just lay your feet, Lord God, and love on you. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord God, we, we gather together and we say, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God. Open the eyes of our hearts. Let us see you a little bit closer, a little bit more. Let us come to know you just a little bit better than we did when we got here. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Open the eyes. time, just you. Open the eyes.
We serve a great God indeed. Before you guys sit down, will you turn around to those who are worshiping with you and say hello? All right. Good morning, New Life Vineyard. Glad you're here today. It's warmer in here than outside, fortunately. It was cold this last week. I don't like it. But praise God. He gives us brightness, and he gives us the sun. He gives us the warmth through his spirit. A few announcements today. Um, February 3rd, put it on your calendar for the men at 7 a.m. It's going to be early. We'll have breakfast and, and fellowship, so come on out. Love to see you there. Put it on my calendar. Also, February 11th, 6 o'clock, we're going to have a Super Bowl party. Bring your friends, bring some snacks, bring some games, so we can, uh, we can have some fellowship, bring some cheer, cheering, some whistles, whatever. We'll have game area, and those who are serious to watch the game, you know, the play board game area, and then those that are serious to watch the game. You know, I know my family, they can care less about football, but they like the fellowship and the games and the board games and stuff. Um, I like the football, though. So come on out for that as well. Also, wanted to give you an update. We have a family promise coming up February 12th through the 15th. Go down there, go into the lobby. Please sign in for you to help with staying overnight, bringing in some dinners for them and so forth so that we can be a blessing to those that are in need and give a helping hand where it's needed. Amen? Uh, so looking forward to that. So don't forget to sign that, uh, sign where you can help out there in the foyer. Um, get planet cards here. Make sure that you give any updates on any information, uh, uh, emails, telephone, prayer requests, or so forth, so we can keep you engaged. Also, kids may be dismissed to, to their classes as of now as well. And for the offering, you can text, you can go to the website to donate as well, or give offering here. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to give back the resources and to give back into your ministry and to give back to you to use to help bless others what you have given and made way for us to have. Dear Lord, take these finances and allocate it correctly so that it could be a blessing to others. Help us to allocate, allocate, allocate our time, our wisdom, our knowledge, our care, our loving spirit, and our joy in you to others to help them build their relationship up with you this season, and this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, backstory. Around about October, someone donated a high-efficiency boiler to us. So we put that in. About 60% the size of the old boiler that we were getting rid of, so we bought another matching one to go with it. And the people we were buying it from said, it'll probably be in around Christmas time. So we're like, okay, the one can probably handle 
pretty well, you know, until it gets really cold, which it did. Then it got really cold and we still don't have the new one in yet. So pray that shows up quick, even, although we are about out of this temperature dip. I was looking at the weather this morning again, and we're going to be like back up in the 50s for the next couple of weeks, and, and it, it'll power us fine through that. So, But pray that it comes in anyway so we can get it in and have, have done with it. Uh, in the meantime, you have my permission to get a little extra Pentecostal if you want today. And I'll just assume that you're so excited about what I'm saying, but if you need to jump and holler and, you know, run around a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll forgive you. Uh, I think some of you breathe a little hotter than first service, or maybe it's just more of you, but it's already more comfortable than it was earlier today. I guess on the topic of things that keep us warm, since we're thinking about that, an interesting question I was mulling over, why is it that people who have had too much to drink, and I mean definitely too much to drink, are inclined to make such bad decisions. Have you ever really thought about that, like explored that? And I'm not saying that with any real condescension. It's, it's the, the scientist in me, I guess, the unprofessional scientist. It's just a thing that is. And I'm the type of person who likes to find out why things are. Why is the sky blue? I never stopped asking that. I got really excited when I found a little great courses thing at Half Price Books a couple years ago on astronomy, and the first thing was our daytime sky. And so it was all the reasons why the sky's blue and how rainbows work, and it was great. But uh, I have questions like this. And some of it is, you know, there's a whole series of memes showing images of something going horribly wrong or about to, captioned with, you know, this started with hold my beer. You know, it had to have. All sorts of things. So it's, it's a thing. And the question I have is, what really is the connection? What's the, the correlation between alcohol consumption and poor decision-making? Because as far as I know, and, and maybe you know of some exceptions, but there's not a generally observed correlation between alcohol and good decision-making, right? I, I have never in my life heard a story that concluded with, oh, wow, it's a good thing I was drunk because I was really about to make a bad decision there. <laughs> Again, any exceptions are few enough, they probably have to be considered exceptions. Now, biology gives us two reasons, and you may know this or, or part of it. Alcohol increases norepinephrine in the brain. Norepinephrine is something of a stimulant, and it increases impulsiveness while decreasing inhibition, reluctance. What does that mean? It means that there's less sensitivity to potential consequences of any decision, good or bad. Also, separately from that, alcohol temporarily impairs the prefrontal cortex in your brain. We talked about this a little bit last summer. The prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that enables you to connect dots, to think rationally and thus make good decisions. So alcohol is one of you know, many substances that free a person to act without thinking clearly or without feeling appropriately about what might happen next. It might make us brave when we should perhaps be cautious. It might make you loud when you'd be better off being quiet. I think it was the comedian Ron White was talking about being arrested for public drunkenness, and he said, I had the right to remain silent, but I did not have the ability to. (laughs) People who've had too much to drink or, or, you know, something like it. Interestingly enough, pornography affects the brain in very similar ways, just chemically. People under the influence are inclined to make bad decisions because they are temporarily desensitized to social, cultural, and specifically relational cues or or signals from the setting they're in. They don't consciously ignore common sense. It's more like common sense isn't even there to be ignored. And, And again, we're not talking about being a little bit buzzed. We're talking about, you know, getting hammered. Those signals are suppressed. Their conscience is in some ways switched off at that point. Now, what does this have to do with you and me? Well, if you are drunk this morning to stay warm, we just described what this has to do with you. For those of us who are here this morning sober, we'll get to that in a second. We are in part four of our series, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets, based off book by the same name from Andy Stanley. We've been exploring an often overlooked relationship between good questions and good decisions. It's a really important relationship, so I've been mentioning this every week. Good questions generally set us up for making better decisions. So if you can get yourself in the habit of asking more questions and better questions, I really believe your life will show a notable difference. You'll have a better impact on those around you, and regrets will begin to shrink. 
So right at the beginning, we dove into Proverbs a little bit because Proverbs is this love letter to wisdom, and wisdom is one of the ways God leads us. So it's worth paying attention. Anybody willing to try out that verse today? Just go ahead and launch into it. Be brave. Awesome. Kudos. All right. All the rest of you get an F. Still, we're four weeks into this. Like, come on, guys. It's not that, that long. The sensible see danger and they take cover. They adapt. They go around. They prepare. They adjust. The inexperienced, or some translations, the simple, the naive, they just ignore the signals and they keep going and they suffer for it. And the reason this is so important is because we've been talking about that inner sales voice, right, that we all have that wants you to act fast, move now, decide quickly, think about immediate outcomes instead of ultimate outcomes. So Solomon reminds us to put that voice on hold and look beyond this moment. Don't look away from potential danger that might be sitting next to an option you're selling yourself on. So the five questions in this series are tools that we're learning to pick up and carry along that help us slow down before we run into trouble so we can make better decisions and later on look back on fewer regrets. The first question was the integrity question, right? Am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself? Really? The second question was last week. It's called the legacy question. What story do I want to tell? When this decision becomes a memory and a story I tell someone else later when they ask, what story do I want to be able to tell when I'm looking back on this moment? That story is up to you, one decision at a time. Today we're doing the third question, it's called the conscience question, which brings us back to our opening question about intoxicated people. While they maybe can't pay attention to external signals or maybe even internal signals, Those of us who are sober are still often guilty of choosing to ignore those signals anyway, right? Intoxicated people have basically silenced their conscience for a temporary period, but sober people sometimes choose to ignore our consciences. And by conscience for today, I'm talking about that internal tension competing for our attention when we're considering an option that might lead to regret, maybe, maybe not. Truly intoxicated people can't help themselves, but oftentimes we won't help ourselves. And the outcome, the consequences, can sometimes be no less devastating. So the third question that we should ask any time we have a decision to make of any kind, the third question is this, is there a tension that deserves my attention? Is there a tension that deserves my attention? When I'm considering options, and I'm sort of focusing in on one in particular that is looking pretty good to me, does that option create any kind of attention inside me that I should recognize is here? Perhaps more often than we like to admit, they're looking at an option, we're looking there, and, and we're considering something, and there is a tension that, that comes up. Something about it just doesn't feel quite right. It gives us a little pause, causes us to hesitate, And initially, we may have no reason why. We can't say exactly why. You may have heard this referred to as like a red flag moment. Some of you might call it your gut, you know, intuition. If you have a more spiritual framework for life or you're around people that do, you might hear the phrase, I have a check in my spirit about that. I I have a check in my spirit about this. And something's holding me up and I'm not really sure what it is. Now, people that have walked with Jesus for a good while have learned the Holy Spirit sometimes can communicate this way. So, so you, you get that check, something pulls back, and you're thinking, well, okay, maybe God's leading me. It might be the Holy Spirit is trying to help you out by cautioning you against an option because He has information you don't have yet. So He may be drawing you away from a thing or maybe toward a thing uh, that is safer or away from a thing that ultimately could be unhealthy, maybe even dangerous. Back in the 1500s, St. Ignatius put a couple big words on this. He spoke of this drawing of the Spirit in terms of experiencing consolation, which is kind of like this this swelling of the Spirit, this kind of like take a deep breath and it just kind of feels a little bit better. And so life kind of 
springs, springs up inside you and draws you closer to the things of God, or desolation, that withering, that something kind of dying, that ugh, feeling you get sometimes when you think about something. So in old time speak, when they use big words for everything, they call that consolation and desolation as ways of discerning in your spirit the good or evil of a thing. It isn't always the Holy Spirit, it can be. The Apostle Paul talks about conscience separate from the Holy Spirit. So sometimes an option in front of you might be triggering a suppressed experience, just a a bad memory. For instance, you may have nearly drowned at the beach when you were a kid. So now when your spouse suggests taking the family to the beach for vacation this year or next week because it's really cold, you like the idea, but you notice something inside you kind of has a tension with that suggestion, with that option. So you might have different names for these red flags. Different names are probably good because some come from God, some are internal, some might be evil influences trying to like mess with you and scare you out of a good thing. But I think we all know the feeling, that internal sense of something about this, don't know what it is, don't ask me a lot of questions right now, but something just doesn't seem right. And when that pops up, you don't necessarily live by it without questions, but you owe it to yourself to pause and pay attention to that tension. Don't ignore it, don't Brush by it as indigestion. It may be, but it also may not be. So pause long enough to test it out a bit. Let it bother you for a moment. The problem is, of course, this isn't easy. It's not a a natural thing to do for all the reasons we've been talking about in this series. We've got focalism that blurs and exaggerates one thing over all the others, like tunnel vision. Confirmation bias skews the facts out of proportion to support what we already want to do. Our schedules compress things and create urgency and they push and emotions can cloud things up and remove clarity. That salesperson in our head is always in a hurry. And as all of these things act upon us, sometimes at the same time, I think we often come under the impression that what's bothering us probably isn't bothering anybody around us. Have you ever ever had that kind of like, this is bothering me, but I don't see anybody else having problems, so maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe Maybe it's just me. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You know, everybody else seems like they look to be fine with whatever I'm, I'm thinking about here. My spouse doesn't appear to be noticing any red flags, so maybe it's nothing. Nobody in the office seems to be wrestling with their consciences. Technically, this option isn't illegal. It's not even really immoral, but you just feel like there's something not right. So when something dings your conscience, pay attention. Pay attention. Now, you, you may be thinking at this point, depending on the type of person you are, Nathaniel, look, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where all we're going to go with this, but I don't make decisions based on feelings. You know, I just, some intangible tension that probably doesn't mean anything. I, you know, I just look at the facts, and then I decide based on the facts. That's how I approach life. Well, let me to push back just a little bit. I know it feels like that's what you do, but actually you don't, okay? We wish we did. There, there are many cases when, when this could be a spiritual thing from outside you, Holy Spirit or something, but there are many other cases when it's not. People who study the brain are discovering that many times when we have these red flag moments, it can actually be a specific part of our brain alerting us to pay attention to something we don't see yet. Our brains are really good at noticing patterns, and it can notice patterns so quick that you don't even have time to think about it yet. And our brains also contain a lot of information we think we forgot a long time ago. So there are parts of our brains that can turn on this flashing light to say, hey, hey, hey I, think I'm, I think I'm noticing something here. Uh, give me a moment. Let me check my files real quick, okay? If the, if the judge would just hold off on the decision for a moment, there's, there's new evidence that might show itself to be relevant. So let's just, whoa. So if facts are your thing, this tension in you can be a signal that there may be more facts in play than what you currently see on the surface. It isn't just emotionalism. It may be a part of your intellect trying to slice through the fog of what might be exaggerated and distracting bits of information, that cluttering up your ability to think rationally right now. So pay attention to the tension. And then, and then there's this. We've all had this experience, right? You're, you're considering an option. You're in the middle of making this decision, and you have a plan coming together, and nothing about it bothers you. This is perfect. This is one of the most beautiful plans you've ever put together in your life. And then somebody else comes along and points out something you hadn't thought of yet. And all of a sudden, there's a tension. 
where before there was no tension, now they mention this thing and, and there's hesitation. It's usually your mom, right? Moms are great at this. Honey, that, that sounds great and all, except for the fact I think it's illegal. Could be a friend, you know, hey, that sounds awesome. What's, what's your wife going to think about that? Tension. Does your boss know about this yet? Tension. Doesn't your contract rule that out? Tension. When I was working at the body shop, I was getting my skills to the point I started thinking, this might be how I can finally afford to get a Mustang. So I'd always wanted one. So I realized I could get one at auction. The more I learned the car world, you can get one at auction that's been wrecked, preferably rear end damage, so you don't have to mess with hidden engine issues that come out later. But I could do this. And it, and it would be way more affordable. So I'm getting my plan together, trying to figure out some costs. My boss said I could do it, and I could store it at the shop while I'm working on it there in my off hours. I keep it there. And, it, and it just in passing one day, I happened to mention it to my dad, and he says, you need a Mustang like you need a hole in the head. And if you've met my dad visiting here, you can probably hear him saying it. It wasn't me. It was just a statement, the way my dad does. But tension now, like, there's a little bit of like conflicting thoughts going on. And of course, the problem with someone else bringing things to our attention is now there's like a relational tension that goes with it, right? And that's a tension you should pay attention to as well. Because we all, including me, we all have this tendency sometimes to dodge the truth by discounting the truth teller, right? Like, I love my dad, but he doesn't do auto body work. He doesn't understand the benefit to my skills. You know, if I take on this project and I see it through, I'll learn a lot more stuff. And it'll be really good for me and, and my career, you know, here working on cars. You know, we, we do that. What does he know? What does she know? They've never actually run a company, so they can't know the nuances of my problem. Her family isn't as messed up as mine has been, so she just can't see it. He doesn't even have kids. Why is he trying to talk to me about fatherhood? They've never been a pastor So they can't truly relate. This came from that news network, so obviously nothing they say can be helpful, right? So we can get technical one more time. Experts refer to this as something called the genetic fallacy or the fallacy of origins. A fallacy is just a mistaken belief, coming to the wrong conclusion. And basically this one goes like this. Since I don't like where the information is coming from, I'm just to ignore the information. I'm just going to toss it out, probably without even looking at it, because I don't like the source. And honestly, when you say it like that, that's pretty dumb, right? I mean, that's, that's ignorant. That's not wise. Now, it's fair to feel the need to double check info that comes from sources you've learned not to trust, but don't just toss it out without checking. So honestly, the wise thing to do is you consider options. If there's any hesitation around this choice, this one in front of you, pause and allow that tension to rise up and get as big as it possibly can get before you decide. If something bothers you, let it bother you. If something about him just doesn't seem right, if something about her just kind of just let it bother you. That, that job offer, that deal, this fine print, let it bother you. Embrace it. Don't just excuse it. Face that tension until either it goes away on its own or you've figured out why it's there, and then you can judge if it's relevant. Last week, we talked about one of my favorite people in Scripture. This week, I want to look at a rather well-known narrative from another of my favorites. Uh, David steps into pages as a, of history as a shepherd boy, youngest of eight boys. Unlike Joseph from last week, who was dad's favorite, David doesn't seem to be considered any more special than his brothers, maybe a little less. And during that season, while he's out taking care of the family flocks, a prophet and and this huge national political figure essentially shows up at his house for whatever reason, and David gets called in from the fields and finds out everybody's already had dinner and they've been hanging out and he didn't know anything about it. But this guy announces that God has chosen David to be the next king of Israel. That's a pretty good day for the family, right? The problem is Israel already had a king. Saul was Israel's first king, first ever, and he started out well, but lately Saul has been doing a pretty poor job of kinging. So God decides to replace him, just not quite yet. 
So time goes by, and young David has his legendary encounter with the Philistine giant Goliath that, that most of us have heard that story. And the moment after killing Goliath by slinging a rock into the giant's forehead and then taking the giant's sword and cutting his head off, David immediately becomes a household name throughout the kingdom of Israel and the territory of the Philistines. This victory gives him an inside track toward military command, and he excels at it. He becomes not just a great warrior, but a great leader. And it doesn't take long before his popularity goes beyond that of old King Saul's, who by now is really not a very good king, something of a diva, and he knows he's fallen out of favor with God, so he's getting pretty cantankerous. And Saul gets jealous of David and tries to kill David. So David, who at this point has done nothing wrong, is forced to flee. He becomes a fugitive. But by now, he's also a legend as far as the people of Israel are concerned. He's a hero. So as time goes on, dozens and eventually hundreds of men flock to David's side, running around in the wilderness from Saul. And before long, he's got this whole little army following him around. But an army without a home, much like the Robin Hood legend, It's an army of misfits made up of people like David, fugitives. For some time, Saul and Israel's official army play cat and mouse with David's band of fugitives, taking time off here and there to deal with the Philistines, who were an ongoing threat. And eventually, Saul gets some good intel on David's whereabouts. He gathers about 3,000 of Israel's finest, which is a pretty good-sized army for that day, because Saul feared David and David's capabilities as a military leader. So he leads this large column of soldiers into the desert of En Gedi to remove this threat to his throne once and for all. He's heard by this point that David had long ago been anointed as the next king. But Saul has a son, Jonathan, who by all rights of human custom should be the next king. So they're winding their way through the rocky, windswept hills of En Gedi. And late one afternoon, Saul halts the column of men so he can find somewhere to relieve himself. He spies a cave a little way off, and he heads in to get some privacy. Now, if you know this story, you know this is where it takes kind of a strange yet yet providential twist. David and his handful of merry men are actually hiding deep in the back of this same cave. Now, apparently, David had had his scouts out like any good leader, and when they saw Saul's army heading their way, David must have told everyone to hide and let the soldiers pass through, and then when Saul's gone they can double back and escape in the opposite direction. So they're just hiding and waiting. All this is working perfectly until Saul gets the need for a rest stop. The line halts. He gets off his mount and starts walking straight for David's cave all by himself. There's no time now to reposition. Fairly deep cave, so David presses his guys further back. Just hold your breath, fellas. A couple minutes later, David's peeking out and he he sees, sees a silhouette step into the entrance. Saul's eyes are probably still adjusting from from daylight, so he can't see a thing. Comes in just far enough for privacy, gets his robes out of the way, and he squats down facing the opening of the cave with his back toward David. Now clearly, if you're David, this is a sign from heaven. God has just handed your persecutor to you on a silver platter. I mean, what else could this mean? The coincidence is too great. God must have something going on. David has already been anointed the next king. The whole country's on his side. Everyone knows what's coming next. The only thing standing in his way is this current wretched king who has already lost favor from God anyway. And here he is, unguarded, vulnerable, unsuspecting. And if David by some chance hasn't had all this going on in his mind to this point, the historian records that David's men were thinking this through. A couple of the other guys near David whisper over to him, David, sir, look, this is the day the Lord told you about. This is the day the Lord told you about back back when he told you a long time ago, I will hand your enemy over to you so you can do to him whatever you desire. And, And here he is, David. This is what you predicted. So what did David do? All right, let's kill Saul and go home. Enough with this wilderness fugitive running around thing. The scenario doesn't get any better than this. I kill him now, we avoid a civil war, and who knows how much bloodshed along the way. And everyone's thinking, David, come on, just just do it. He's out here trying to kill you. It's self-defense. Kill him before he gets you. Otherwise, we just keep running until they do finally trap us and, and get us. It's a lot of emotion in the cave that afternoon. So much adrenaline and 
pressure to act and do it now, decide quickly. But what makes this story even more interesting is we can tell David felt something else as well. There was a tension about this. There was a hesitation about this option. Something wasn't exactly right for him. But David creeps up behind Saul with his dagger out. And and despite it going against logic, David lets what's bothering him bother him enough to hold him back. He is seconds away from the possibility of his life changing for the better, but he doesn't go for the kill. He knows this isn't really war. This isn't combat with an enemy nation. This is murder, and this can't be right. Besides, he thought to himself, who put Saul on the throne of Israel to begin with? Who made Saul the king? God had done that. Who am I to replace what God has put in place? God may have anointed me to be next, but he never told me to take responsibility for timing. Now, this is the part of the story where we all have something in common with David, believe it or not. Because David did not know what the outcome of killing Saul would be. He could guess at it, kill the king, become the king, problem solved, go home. But David couldn't know for sure what would follow if he killed Saul in this moment. There's no guarantees things would work out this way. This is what we have in common. One of the reasons that we ignore the inner tension when we make decisions, one reason we we push through and ignore the advice of other people and the voice of our conscience and the prodding signals from the Holy Spirit, one reason we push through all that is this. We believe that in certain circumstances, we can predict the future, that we can predict or, or maybe control outcomes. And when we get in that frame of mind, when we're convinced we can predict outcomes, when we think we know, we make decisions we oftentimes regret because we don't know. We miss things. We overlook things. Sometimes we simply don't know things that were things. You don't always predict outcomes accurately, do you? I mean, who does? Let me ask it this way. Have you ever been disappointed? Of course you have. And what's disappointment, really? Disappointment is what we experience when we mispredict the future. We thought it was going one way, it goes a different way, we get disappointed. That, that tension in your gut, then, your intuition, that check in your spirit, is often a signal that you might be trying to predict the future based on incomplete or wrong information. And if nothing else, it's a reminder you can't know everything. And if you do proceed with this choice, whatever this option is, do it with humility. Go forward with extra watchfulness and without arrogance. So here's David. He's he's inches away from Saul. And he knows he does not want this chapter of his life to be titled, The Man Who Killed His King. The Man Who Killed God's Anointed. I, I don't want to tell my grandchildren that story. So the thought comes to him, he probably should just creep back to the back of the cave and wait it out. But I don't think he knows how to explain this red flag moment to his men yet. Going back empty-handed would be kind of awkward, so he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe that Saul had probably taken off and laid over a rock. And then with trophy in hand, David makes his way back to his men. And the expression on their faces say it all. The perfect opportunity has just slipped through our fingers. Come on, David. But the text says David's conscience bothered him. That's how we know he was acknowledging and wrestling with an inner tension. He was conscience stricken. He was probably glad that he hadn't followed through on actually killing Saul. But he knew that even this move of bringing back the trophy was an act of arrogance. He had talked over his own conscience to do even that little bit, and now he's remorseful. So he whispers back to his men, I swear before the Lord, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. Probably more than one of his men jump in with, well, then I'll do it. If your conscience won't allow it, I'm not afraid to do the deed and get this heat off our backs. I don't know why you think God's holding you back, but I don't feel any conviction about it, David. I think God just handed him to us on a silver platter. That's what I think. But David rebukes his men and does not allow them to attack Saul. 
And Saul leaves the cave feeling fine, goes on his merry way, having no idea how close he came to losing his life in that moment. Saul gets back out on his mule or his horse or whatever he's riding that day, and he gets his army ready to keep searching for David when suddenly the drama isn't over. Suddenly, he hears a voice calling to him, My Lord, the King! And 3,000 heads turn, and there stands the very man that they've been hunting, the man they're paid to kill, the giant killer turned general. He's in the mouth of the very cave Saul just came back from. Can you you imagine that moment? Everyone's like wide-eyed and holding their breath. What's going to happen next? And David's holding something up, looks like a, a piece of cloth. Doesn't it have the same coloring as Saul's robe? Saul yanks his cape around, and sure enough, there's a corner missing. But then David bows to the ground in the mouth of the cave, and everyone in the valley recognizes in this moment that David is the better man. Once again, David is the hero in his own story. He spared Saul's life when everyone knew Saul would have taken David's. David gives a short speech and then concludes with a a very powerful statement, something I think we should all take to heart. With everyone listening, he says to Saul, May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord be the judge. I will wait and I'll allow God to determine the outcome of this conflict. I won't take matters into my own hands, Saul. I will not replace what God has put in place. I will not play God over your life, Saul. I will not play God in mine. I will not use your bad behavior as an excuse for me to do bad things. Saul, I won't be like you. This was a measured response. This was a a thought-through response that resulted from paying attention to an inconvenient, a very inconvenient, irrational tension. Well, all eyes are now on Saul. He's, He's been truly humiliated. Everyone knows he's a diva, and he's got a sensitive ego. So he's been humiliated, but not by David's military skill. He wasn't beat up on in the battlefield. He's humiliated by David's humility. So what do you do now if you're King Saul? You you tell your guys to go take the life of the man who just now chose not to take yours? Yeah, it's probably not too good airing on the news networks tomorrow. So you say, all right, I'm going to close my eyes and count to 100 and give you a head start because honor demands I give you something now. No, even, even Saul knows better. He turns his army around and he heads back home. David had a choice in the cave to be maybe a villain. At best, you might would call it being an anti-hero kind of figure like is popular in literature and movies today. Instead, he chose to be the hero. It's another thing we share in common with David. You get that choice too. Like we talked about last week, you get to choose what story you will later be able to tell about this moment, this decision, this conscience tension is a reminder that you are in a defining moment right now. You are in a choose-your-next-chapter kind of moment. Months later, Saul and his army are in a heated battle with the Philistines. After a period of intense fighting, a random Philistine archer just lets fly an arrow, just dropping it in behind Israel's lines. But this random arrow found a seam in Saul's armor, and he's mortally wounded. He's too proud to die at the hands of the Philistines or get captured, so he falls on his own sword and dies as his army is routed. And when word finally makes its way back to Saul's capital, this is before Jerusalem, when word reaches the city, the citizens proclaim David their next king. So David does finally become king without murdering a king being part of his story. And maybe, this isn't in the text, but maybe, I I wonder, David thought to himself, well, if somebody had told me it was going to work out like this, It would certainly have made that whole cave episode a lot easier. You know, if God had sent an angel to say, hey, David, just relax, seven chapters from now, the Philistines are going to take care of Saul for you, wouldn't that have made things so much easier? But, I mean, we know that's not how life works. That's why we dare not assume we can take all the details into our own hands. We we dare not trust our own ability to see all the angles perfectly all the time and predict the future or control the outcomes. So whenever you're making a decision of any consequence, you have to stop and ask yourself, is there a tension 
that deserves my attention? Is their attention warning me there might be more going on here than I can now see? When my dad told me I needed a Mustang like I needed a hole in the head, I kind of laughed it off. That was just my dad being dad. I want the Mustang, right? And I want to prove to myself I can do this. I wasn't thinking about a lot of other things, like exactly how much time it would take in my evenings and weekends, in my first year of marriage, no less. Uh, It's time I wouldn't have been able to give to the ministry stuff Barbie and I were doing on the side. Uh, It may have been cheaper, a lot cheaper than buying a good condition Mustang, but there still would have been money involved that could probably have been put to better use in our first year of marriage. So I let that, that tension set and fester for a while. I chose not to rush out to an auction and find a wrecked Mustang. I I didn't exactly give up on the idea, but I chose not to move on it right then. Let me see what happens. Well, What my dad didn't know at the time, what I didn't know, but what the Holy Spirit did know, was six months later, Barbie and I would get hired to do full-time ministry two states away. So we moved where I had no access to a body shop and would not have been able to finish this project, and it would have been a weight hanging around my neck. So here's what I know about you. Your decision that you're wrestling with right now, it probably falls somewhere between choosing whether or not to invest in a thing you don't really need and murdering a king. It's probably somewhere between the two, right? But wherever you are on that spectrum, the principle is the same. If there's something in you that you can't quite put your finger on yet, or perhaps something that someone else has put their finger on that bothers you, about an option you're considering, don't just ignore it. Don't brush by it. I don't know, but it may be God's way of protecting you, protecting your family. It might not be, but if it is, you owe it to yourself to follow that thread and see where it leads. We'll pick up here next time with our fourth question, but before we close, I've got three more discussion questions for us to play with this week. You can work these out in a journal if you're sitting at home by yourself, but I'd really love for you to answer these uh, out loud with someone that you're sitting next to or watching with, someone or some ones you're comfortable getting in a deeper conversation. So number one, what is your name, your name for your internal warning system? You call them red flags, yellow flags, checking your spirit, intuition. What's your language for this? And maybe experiment with coming up with different names as you learn to recognize whether this is from you or whether it's from the Holy Spirit, you know, like different kinds of flags. Because I know some people who just assume it's all internal biochemistry and they don't allow for the Holy Spirit to be involved. I know other people who think every impulse they get is a spiritual thing and they don't allow space for something to be, you know, helpful, but still just internal. Number two, have you ever been really close to saying yes on a big decision? But at the last minute, you bailed for no other reason than something just didn't sit right with you. If you have, describe what you experienced in that situation for the person you're talking with. Tell that story. Reprocess that. What was going on inside and outside? What was around? If that is the case, and you do have that kind of story to tell, the the people you're sitting next to now or watching with, they might could benefit from hearing that story. Number three. In what way does our memory verse from Proverbs support the habit of paying attention to this inner tension? What's the relationship between the verse and this principle? Talk that out. Look at it from some different angles. See what you come up with. Would you stand with me? I'd like the worship team to come up. I think an appropriate prayer as we close today would be this. Holy Spirit, soften my heart to your voice. Make me sensitive to the way you guide me, whether that is with learning principles of wisdom, whether that is you speaking directly to me, whether that's opening Scripture up to speak into my soul. The writer of Hebrews chapter 4, he said, For the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Scripture is effective for helping you get clarity on the inside, what's going on, testing things. Jesus said in John 10, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So let's invite God to speak to us. Let him lead you with his voice. Let him speak to you with his word. Let him lead you with wisdom, with his spirit. Let him fine-tune your conscience a little bit this week and get that 
sensitivity turned up a little bit, get that heightened. And, and when he uses any of these things to ask you to pause in the middle of a decision, be ready to heed the warning and start asking why. Follow the bird seed. See where it's going. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence with us. I thank you for always being accessible. Anytime that we need someone to ask what's going on, we don't have to wait for you to get off the phone or get out of your meeting. You're with us all the time. And I pray that you would help us turn up that sensitivity in, in our hearts, in our spirits, so that when you respond back and when you're prodding, even when we don't ask for it, we'd recognize that and be able to follow. Lord, lead us in a path that draws us closer to you, walking closer step by step with you, Lord, so that we can hear even the gentlest of whispers that you might send our way. Lord, I love the, the relationship that you've called us into. If there are any here that have never known you in that way, don't, don't see you as a person that's been asking them to walk with you in life. I pray that you would put that image in their hearts, that invitation in their hearts to just come walk with you and to know you and be known by you, to hear your voice and to follow so that we can have that companionship and have that good leadership when we can't trust the sales voice in our heads, when we can't trust the influences from other outside sources. Teach us to know that voice that we can trust that always leads us true. Jesus, you said you'd give us the Holy Spirit who would lead us into all truth. So I pray that you'd give us the confidence to trust that and look for the Holy Spirit to lead us anytime we need to know the truth of a situation. Guide us. Help us take real steps this week, putting that in motion. In Jesus' name, amen.
So glad you guys came out to worship with us today. If you would like some prayer, we have a prayer team down front. Please come down front and get prayer if you want. Hope you guys have a great day. See you next week. God bless you.